Okay, well, good morning. I guess we'll go ahead and get started. Uh, we're going to continue in James. So, uh, James chapter 1, we're still in chapter 1, and we're going to consider uh, on your handout there verses 18 through 27 today, which will be a little bit of a backtracking and a review, and then uh, kind of move forward uh, in the book of James. So, but we'll read uh, verses 18 through 27, and then we'll pray, and then we'll. Um, See what we can learn from God's word today. James chapter 1, verse 18. Of his own will, he brought us forth by the word of truth, that we should be a kind of first fruits of his creatures. Know this, my beloved brothers, let every person be quick to hear, slow to speak, slow to anger. For the anger of man does not produce the righteousness of God. Therefore, Put away all filthiness and rampant wickedness and receive with meekness the implanted word which is able to save your souls. But be doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving yourselves. For if anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer, he is like a man who looks intently at his natural face in the mirror. For he looks at himself and goes away and at once forgets what he was like. But the one who looks into the perfect law, the law of liberty, and perseveres, being no hearer who forgets, but a doer who acts, he will be blessed in his doing. If anyone thinks he is religious and does not bridle his tongue, but deceives his heart, this person's religion is worthless. Religion that is pure, and undefiled before God the Father is this, to visit orphans and widows in their affliction and to keep oneself unstained from the world. Okay, let's pray. Father, again, we thank you that you have given us this word that, that teaches us, that instructs us, that it tells us where we're, we're missing the point, but corrects us as well. So, Lord, as we... Uh, as we look at the word through your servant James today, uh, may it do just that. May it point to us, may we use it as a, as a litmus test as to our faith and our true faith. Look inward to the things that are taught here to see if we are doing them or not doing them. And so, Lord, uh, just may this, uh, this time be used for that. May I speak clearly and understandably and not misrepresent what is said here. So we ask these things in your son's name. Amen. All right, so just a little recap. Again, the book of James is written to uh, the Jewish Christians in the dispersion. That means spread around uh, throughout the country because of persecution that the early church faced. Um, in verses 2 through 17, which we went uh, over several, several weeks ago, it's, a, it's a, a section of the testing of our faith. The testing of our faith through trials and through temptations. Um, and so it's, it's, a, it's a test to see if we are a true believer or not. Do we truly rely on God for getting through the trials which we all face? Uh, or do we rely on other things, the things of this world, other people's opinions, um, the ideologies of the world? Things like that is, uh, is what this tests us for. Um, and it's, it's, uh, the question is when we face both trials and temptations which are common to man, is again where do we get our truth from where do we get our wisdom from where do we get our strength from to endure those trials or to resist those temptations and it tells us in those first chapters very clearly if any of you lacks wisdom you ask god the wisdom that is needed to get through trials the wisdom that's needed to to resist temptations comes from god it does not come from the world so so getting through those things uh and uh, it comes from a, um, the strength to get through those things does not come from within you, but comes from within the word of God. And in doing so, uh, it, the Bible tells us that's how we grow spiritually mature and spiritually stronger is as we get through those trials, using God's wisdom to get through those trials, uh, he will make us spiritually stronger during that time. So, True believers, as I wrote down there, they'll develop that steadfastness and spiritual strength through trials because they rely on God's wisdom to get them through those trials, not the world's wisdom. And the interesting point in the, uh, 
purposes of God is the same Greek word for trials, is the same Greek word for temptations. And it means a proof, a testing, because that's exactly what they do. In God's economy, the trials are placed there for a purpose, a purpose to test us, to try us, to make us steadfastly uh, grow in spiritual maturity so that we can be perfect in every way. So that's kind of verses 2 through 17. And then so I'm going to ask you a question that I know the answer to already. Okay, but I'm going to ask you a question. Why do you come to Providence Church? I didn't hear that, but let me give you a couple of suggestions. Is it, is it because of this beautiful building, which it is a nice building, I grant it, but it's because it's just so much better than every other church around that you're going to come to this building? Is that the reason we come to church? Huh? Okay. Or, or is it the entertainment? Okay, entertainment's good, don't get me wrong, but is that the reason that you come every Sunday? No. Okay. How about um, you got a rock star preacher, right? That's why you come, right? No, he's good. And he used to be a rock star, I think. He had hair down to here. But again, that's not why you come. You come because you want to hear the word rightly taught. Rightly taught, the whole counsel of the word of God, rightly taught. And, and that's the reason why you come. And, 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 the, and the, really the, the underlying uh, background of James here really is about the word of God. Initially, it's how you use the word of God to get you through the temptations and trials of life. Uh, in verse 18, the word, he says, the word is the means by which he brings you forth. He's the one that, that brings you forth. You remember John talks about monergism. It's all his power that brings you to God. But he uses the word as a means uh, to, for you to understand it. And then in verses 21, it talks about the implanted word in you. The implanted word. We know what that is. That's the truth that God places in you when he regenerates you. Verses 22 and 23, it talks about being doers of the word. Right? Not just hearers only. In verse 25, it speaks of the, the perfect law, the law of liberty, which are all, all terms that mean the same thing. The word of God. It's all they refer to scripture. They include everything that's written in the laws, written in the, uh, the New Testament, Old Testament, all the words of Jesus, his teachings, etc. That is the word that we want to hear. And as John spoke uh, a, couple, a couple of weeks ago, in verses 19 through 20, he talked about kind of be looked at under three levels. It can be looked at in kind of a, a superficial general level that these instructions of being, um, you know, uh, quick to hear, slow to speak, and slow to anger, uh, just kind of a general instructions on how we should act as Christians. And that's true, but that would set it just kind of different from everything else that's been flowing. He also said you can, you can uh, uh, interpret those in relation to the historical context. And by that, we mean the early church being that, uh, that mesh of Jews and Gentiles, Jews that are the chosen people and Gentiles that were the pagan sinners, right? The Gentile sinners uh, are now worshiping the same God. And the problems that that entail, which we've, been, we've talked about several times before in church as well. So you can, you can look at that as advice he's given to those that are in exile to come together. And this is one way you do it. You don't talk all the time. You listen and then you slow to anger. Okay. Um, but really, in, in, in the literary context of it, when he, James is really speaking this whole section about the word and what it does. Uh, the word, how we use it during trials and temptations. The word, how that is the means by which God brings it to you. The, the implanted word, the word that he placed in your heart uh, as well. The, the truth of scripture as well. So, so in relation to that, let's just kind of quickly go uh, about the quick to hear, the slow to speak, and the slow to anger. The word quick uh, can actually means ready or swift, prompt to hear, to hear and understand. And so, so in relation to the word, we should be anxious. We should be quick to hear the word. We should desire to hear the word. We should have this eagerness to hear the word. We should be quick to hear the word. That's, and, and be not only to hear it, 
but to understand it, to be a good listener, not just a hearer, okay? Listen and understand it. And the reason we do that is because, uh, you know, we have to kind of take honest inventory on ourselves. And I think most of us here have that desire to hear the word, to understand the word, and to listen to the word. But in, uh, in Psalm 1, okay, he tells us quite, quite, quite plainly, blessed is the man who walks out in the counsel of the wicked. He doesn't listen to uh, the wicked type people, nor stands or hangs around with sinners, nor sits in the seat of scoffers. His delight is in the law of the Lord, the word of the law. And on that law, he meditates day and night. That's the desire we should have for the word of God. A little quote there uh, says J.M. That stands for John MacArthur. That's, this is from his commentary. He said, true believers will be marked by an attentive spirit, which will find a way to be in scripture regularly. And not just for the purpose of filling a devotional time, because that's what we're supposed to do, but to grow in the understanding and the knowledge and the truth of the Lord itself. That's the purpose for wanting to hear the scripture, for having an eagerness to hear and to understand the scriptures. And then slow to speak. Now, how does that relate to the word itself? It's kind of a companion to quick to hear. You want to hear if you're talking all the time, you're giving your opinion all the time, you can't hear much, right? That's a, a problem that goes along with that. And so in relation to the word of God, we need to let the word of God speak to us, okay? And we are slow to speak into it. And so as we learn the word of God and we become more desirous to speak it to others, we should be somewhat cautious and reserved on speaking that until we understand things uh, rightly by the way the God, by the way the word has lined it out to us. So, so because we have to understand that everything we speak of the word of God is honoring him, should glorify him, um, it's something that we need to be cautious about and slow to do that. Um, because everything in the Bible, Proverbs 35, every word of God proves true. In other translations, is every word of God is flawless. Because of that, we should be slow. We are not flawless. And so we should be slow to speak that to others until we understand that. In fact, he gives war James gives a little warning we'll talk about when we get to chapter 3. Uh, if you're going to teach or speak the word of God to someone else, he gives that warning that not many of you should become teachers. For you know that we who teach will be judged with greater strictness. Now, who would want that? I mean, it doesn't say you who teach are going to be commended and, you know, stuff because you're going to be judged with greater strictness. Kind of a word of caution as you teach and you speak the scriptures to others, that we're going to honor God, edify others, uh, and, and glorify God in what we say. So be cautious about that. And that really comes into play really with new converts, uh, especially those, like I mentioned, your celebrities who, you know, they're already celebrities. They make a profession of faith to Christ. They they now are put in a position where they can give their, uh, I mean, giving their testimony is, is good, but now they sometimes are put in a position where they're to counsel people and, and tell them things that they're not ready for. They don't understand the word of God. Um, he warns us, I mean, Paul warns us in, in 1 Timothy uh, that he must not be a recent convert or he may become puffed up with conceit and fall into condemnation. So we should be slow to speak the word cautious, uh, but hearing the word, understanding, have that desire to do that. And then slow to anger. Uh, what, what does that mean? That word orgy means not really an explosive type of anger, but kind of one of those that's kind of inside you. You have this inner resentment. It, it may not even be evident to anyone around you, but you kind of have this, this resentment. And, and in relation to the word of God, it, 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 we're hearing a lot of times, and you've all experienced this as you read the, the, the Word of God, you'll, you'll read something in there that well, kind of makes you mad. You say, I don't really like that. I wouldn't have done it that way. I mean, that's, that's not right. Uh, you know, just uh, a couple of examples, you know, when, when the, in the Old Testament, God told them to go it, uh, devote them to destruction. He killed the men, women, children, animals, everything else. 
I mean, our, and that, that doesn't quite sound right or sit well to us. And we can get angry to God like that. We get anger at the word that we hear. Um, or a couple other uh, episodes when, when uh, what was his name, Uzzah, remember he was carrying the, the ark down and it stumbled and he put his hand out and God struck him dead. I mean, he didn't deserve that. I mean, God, couldn't he just give him a little swat and tell him don't do it again? You know, I mean, those things like that kind of anger you. So you need to be slow as you're reading the scriptures, slow to make those uh, decisions, make those ideas, you know, slow to to let them anger you, but to let it teach you again. You know, we, it, it's conflicting with our fallen nature and what we've known all our lives. So we must be slow to get angry with it as word, but we are to, you know, let it teach us. If those are the things God said, he is righteous, we are not, because our anger doesn't produce the righteousness of God. Okay, anything that we get angry at in the word of God is, uh, is unrighteous, because everything that's written in the Word of God is righteous, so we must understand that that Word of God has got to teach us. So we need to be slow to do that. And then in verse 21, it says, therefore, again, therefore, every time you see that, you ask, what is it therefore? It's a transition word, you know, from what he just told us, um, because of what he just said in 19 and 20, he says, therefore, you do this. This is another, this is how you receive the Word of God. You receive it with eagerness, slow to speak it, don't get angry at it, and this is, therefore you receive it like this. And he tells us there's two things that we do there. Okay, number one is we put away all filthiness and rampant wickedness. Okay, that word put away, uh, sometimes translated lay aside, lay down aside, like, like laying down your garments over here. Uh, it's used, just to get an idea of what it's used for in Acts 7:58, when they were stoning Stephen. We probably read this uh, verse before because it names a young Saul there who's watching his garments. But he says that they cast him out of the sea and they stoned him. They stoned Stephen. And the witnesses laid down their garments at the feet of a young man named Saul. They laid him down, and this is not really pleasant, but they laid him down so they could throw the stones harder. Right? They laid him down because the garments hindered them from doing what they wanted to do. But that's the idea of laying it aside and laying it down. It's hindering you from doing what you want to do. And most of the time, though, it's, it's related to laying down or putting aside your old self. Uh, and then so that you can be your new self, so that you can please God. And so um, it's, it's spoke of in Romans 13, 12. It says, so then let us cast off the works of darkness, which is what we did before we were saved, and put on the armor of light. Ephesians 4.22 says, put off your old self, which belongs to the former manner of life and is corrupt through deceitful desires. So he's telling us to put that off, lay it aside because it gets in the way of you serving God. Uh, and then it kind of just uh, describes what it is in verse 31, bitterness, wrath, anger, clamor, anger, put it away along with the mouse. Colossians 3.8 says the same thing, you must put them all away. And it names all the things of our natural man, the anger, the wrath, the malice, slander, obscene talk from your mouth. And then Hebrews in 12.1 kind of tells you why, again, gives you a little bit of idea. It says, therefore, as you recall, Hebrews 12.1 comes right after describing the, the hall of faith. All those who were uh, saved of faith. And then Hebrews 12.1 says, therefore, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, all those that he had just named in chapter 11 that were of faith, let us also lay aside every weight and sin which clings so closely, and let us then run with endurance the race that is set before us. So we got to, uh, James is telling us here, you got to lay aside all these things from the old self so that you can run that race that God has planned for you, that you can um, put away those things so you can serve Christ. And the things he talks about here, filthiness, that's one of those words that's used one time. In moral dirtiness, uncleanliness, wickedness. We kind of know what these things mean. Malice, malignity, depravity. Uh, those are things against others. These are all sins that are within us, that are within our natural man. The same thing that's talked about in Romans 1 when it talks about those people that God has already given over to those sins. 
It says, describes them as they were filled with all manner of unrighteousness, evil, covetousness, malice. They were full of envy, envy murder, strife, deceit, maliciousness. They, they, it lists all the, the uh, attributes of our natural man, of our natural from human. But the word I want you to point out there is that we're rampant. Okay, rampant. Filthy is rampant witnesses. Rampant is uh, basically means when you look it up, superabundance. Okay, abundance means a lot of right. Superabundance means a lot of a lot of a lot. Right, superabundance. So it's it's so he, he's saying here that these things. And most of the time that word that's used is, is used in, in a positive manner because it talks about in Romans 5, 7, the abundance of grace from God. Well, that same word, superabundant, I mean, God's got a lot of grace, right? Not just an abundance, but a superabundance, a never-ending abundance. It kind of goes on forever, right? Um, and then in, verse, in, in uh, Corinthians, he uses that same word as well as an abundance of joy. And that's in the context of, a, of the... Uh, the Macedonian church was in a dire strait, uh, poverty, but because they had so much joy, they were able to give to the church in Judea, which was uh, also undergoing a famine and at the time. So, so it, it, abundance, an overabundance, a superabundance. And so what he's saying here is that, that we're commanded to lay aside all this superabundance of filthiness, wickedness that lives within us, uh, in order to, number two, receive with meekness the implanted word of God. So number one, he says we've got to lay these things aside because they're going to impede us from receiving the word correctly and using that word uh, uh, in our lives. So receive with weakness, I mean with meekness. That means, you know, gentleness, humility. You don't you don't read the word kind of begrudgingly or suspiciously or um, in a prideful manner saying, oh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to try this. If it works for me, I'll do it. No, you read the word because the word is going to teach you. God knows more than you in that word. You humble yourself like John talked about the other. Day. Let it come to you. That's the way you do it. And it's everything you read in the Bible. It's not just to pick and choose. It's not just the ones that you like the ones that you kind of agree with uh, because understanding the word is really and receiving the word and understanding is really the the all-important thing because that's the only way the word can be of benefit to you if you understand what it says and what it's telling you to do and by the strength of the spirit and you can you can do that and then he, he use that word implanted word okay there's another one-time use of a greek word emphytos and it means engrafted or infixed, okay, implanted. We kind of know what that means, right? If someone implants in you a knee or implants in you a heart valve or implants in you any type of device, you didn't do it, right? Something outside of you implanted that into you. And that's the idea here too. This word was implanted into you. It was nothing that you did. It's implanted to you. You were given now the eagerness and the desire to, to study it and to, to learn about it and to, uh, and to put it into practice, but it was placed into you. Um, and again, the word, we're talking about the entirety of Scripture, the gospel, perfect law of liberty, Scripture, all words spoken by Jesus, everything uh, was implanted to you. And that's because, and we've read this verse many times, it's implanted in you because that was the new covenant promise given in the Old Testament by the prophets Ezekiel and Jeremiah, which I wrote down here. We've read these before, but it, it never hurts to read them again because it, it reiterates where your faith in that word came from. It's not of yourself. He says, and I, this is God speaking, I will give you a new heart and a new spirit. I will put within you and I will remove that heart of stone from your flesh and give you a heart of flesh. And I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes and be careful to, to obey my rules. And Jeremiah 31, 33 says, For this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, declares the Lord. I will put my law within them and I will write it on their hearts. 
I will be their God and they shall be my people. So God places that in your heart. And it says it's the only thing that will save your souls. We know that. That is the, the understanding and the word of God and, and the uh, atoning life of Christ that, that that speaks of. So the summary of, of, of just those first three verses with this, God brings forth monergism. He's the one that brings forth by his will and using his word, he regenerates our heart, which another word for that is quickens our heart, regenerate. You probably heard that word. So we now have this eagerness to hear the word, we, we, uh, but when we teach it, we must be cautious to teach it. Um, and we don't let our remaining flesh get in the way or cause us to, to rail at the word of God or be defiant to it. So we're slow to anger to it. But on the contrary, we're to put away all that remaining flesh and all that we were before and receive that word with humility that he has placed within ourselves. So, again, that's a good... Like everything in James here, you can look inwardly, test yourself on that. Is that the way you look at the word? Is that the way you use the word? Um, is that the way you uh, profit from the word? Okay. And then we'll just uh, quickly again, more about the word. Okay. Verse 22. Um, it says, now that we receive the word, though, okay, what do we do, do with it? Okay. Well, now we've heard the word. Well, what do we do with that word? Okay. This is kind of another test for true believers and in verse 22 he says be doers of the word and not hearers only deceiving yourselves so now we have this word implanted in us uh what do we do you know we've heard it he uses the means we've heard it what do we do with it it's another test for us and james tell us what we should do with it and what we should not do with it okay um and this is a warning this is a warning to professing people of God. This is a warning as well as a test for those that sit in our churches. You know, there's people in our churches that come all the time, uh, maybe come every Sunday, bring their Bibles. Maybe they don't bring their Bibles, but sometimes they do. If they bring their Bibles, they either leave them here or they leave them unopened at home. Um, they listen to the music. They listen to the word preached. They hear the word preached, right? Um, they check the box. I'm here. Okay, I heard it. I'm good. Nothing changes. They're just like they were before. They're still in their sin. And this must have been a problem 2,000 years ago for him to say this. You know, for him to say, you know, you don't just hear what I'm saying. You do what I'm telling you to do. Um, and so it's, it's, it's what we should do with the Word of God. He's pretty clear. Matthew Henry says, hearing is in order to doing. You got to think about that in a minute because it's not really good English, but hearing is in order to doing. Yeah. Um, uh, so basically he's saying you, you practice what you hear. Okay. And you do that in two ways. You can do it inwardly through the meditation. You, you, know, you meditate on, the, on his law day and night like, Psalm, like the psalmist says in Psalm 1. Uh, but outwardly by obedience. There, you know, there's two factors to that. Uh, inwardly and outwardly, and you're probably not going to do them outwardly if you're not doing them inwardly either. So it's not enough, and I think I got this from Matthew Henry as well. He says, you know, it's not enough just to remember what you heard. Okay, a lot of people can remember things really well. Uh, I'm getting less and less able to do that, but it's not enough just to remember it. Um, it's not enough just to be able to repeat it. Or, or, or to speak it or to regurgitate it like we used to do on tests. That's what I'd say on, we'd, we'd take in tests. You just kind of regurgitate what they get, gave you. You don't really, it doesn't affect you. You know, you don't remember anything after that. Uh, and it's not enough to, to, to speak, to commend it, to speak highly of the word uh, or even to write or even to teach the word. Okay, you must do the word. That's the idea that he's saying here. Because if you're a hearer, only you're self-deceived. Self-deceive. And that word is an interesting word as well. And I kind of paraphrase all the different way it was, but it's kind of like you're arguing with yourself uh, with smart arguments that make sense, but they're untrue. It's, it's the same way we, we justify things in our mind. They, they make sense to us and they're smart, but they're not true. And that's what the, the hearer does. He justifies it. He's, he's heard the word. He understands it. He knows what he's talking about. But he doesn't do it. It, it. it doesn't change things. And our Lord 
made this very clear in the, the, the parable when he talked about it in Luke 6, 46 to 49. Uh, because those that will come to him at that day and say, Lord, Lord, didn't we do this? Didn't we do that? You know, I know who you are. You know, I know what your teachings are. He says, he says why do you call me Lord and do not do what I tell you? Hmm. Okay. He says, everyone who comes to me and hears my words and, do and does them, I will show you what he's like. He's like a man building a house who dug deep, laid the foundation on the rock. And when the floods rose, the stream broke against that house, could not shake it because it had been built well. But the one who hears and does not do them, my words, is like a man who built a house on the ground without foundation. And when the stream broke against it, immediately it fell, and the ruin of that house was great. Uh, it's just like in, in the people that James spoke of earlier in chapter 1 when he said those people would, would ask God for help and not think he can give it to them. Okay, God, you know, or they don't ask for wisdom from God, or they ask for wisdom, they don't do it. That's what he's saying. That's the idea that Jesus placed it. You hear my words, you understand my words, you do my words. <clears throat> and he says this other places as well, mostly by our Lord. He says, blessed are those who hear the word of God and keep it. John 13, 17, if you know these things, blessed are you if you do them. Romans 2, 13 for it is not the hearers of the law who are righteous before God, but the doers of the law who will be justified. It's not enough just to hear. And by this we know we have come to know him if we keep his commandments. It's the doing. And what is it that keeps us from doing sometimes? Oh, it's the pride of your heart. <laughs> That's what keeps you from doing sometimes. You know better. But the pride of your heart is what deceives you into thinking you know better. And as we warned of that in 1 Corinthians, let no one deceive himself. Okay, if anyone among you thinks he's wise in this age, let him become a fool that he may be wise. If you think you know better than God, uh, you're going to be shown that you, you do not. <laughs> um, in Galatians 6, 3, for if anyone thinks he is something when he is nothing, he deceives himself. Uh, in 1 John, if we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves. That's the idea. If we, the law shows us our sin and who we are. If we somehow think we don't apply, that doesn't apply to us, we're just self-deceived. That's all there is to it. Then he gives a couple of examples here. Uh, for if anyone is here, word not dear, he is like this. If you're here and you're not doing, you're like this man who looks intently at his natural face in the mirror, for he looks at himself, he goes away, and at once forget what he was like. But the one who looks into the perfect law, the law of liberty, and perseveres, being no hearer who forgets, but a doer who acts, he will be blessed in his doing. So James tells us kind of the right use of the hearing of the words, okay, and the wrong use. He gives us the wrong use first in 23 and 24. It's an illustration. It's an analogy. I have to admit I had a hard time with this analogy over the years. Every time I read it, I just didn't get it. And... You know, you kind of have to look into it, and I think I get it now, okay? But the, the analogy is this. You know, it's a, a mirror. You're looking into a mirror. And what do you go to a, a mirror to do? Admire yourself? Look at all my perfectness? Now, you go there to look for the little flaws that, like, women, I'm going to cover that up with a little makeup. I'm going to cover that up with a little makeup. You know, you look for the, the flaws, something you can do something about. It'd be like a man going going there and, you know, uh, I'm going to shave. And then he kind of half, gets halfway through and just kind of leaves. Or he looks at all these things that are wrong and just, and just sees them, knows they're there, but then he just leaves and forget about them. Like, like a woman might see him and do them and then go away and not put her makeup on. Okay, heaven forbid that would happen. But it, it's the analogy. You look at it, you see what's wrong because the mirror hears the word of God. Okay, you look intently into this Word of God, uh, and what does the Word of God show us? Our sin. It shows us our sin, and it shows us a sinless Savior. So it, it, so it, it kind of lets us know who we are, really, and the faults that we have. So if you're a hearer and not a doer, 
Okay, you, you look at that self, and maybe you're convicted for a little while, there's a couple things wrong with me, but then you go away and you kind of forget about it, and nothing changes. You're still in your sin. Okay, Matthew Henry, I think, uh, I didn't give him credit for that, but he says the word flatters no man. You can't read the word and think that you're somebody. Okay, you read the word and you realize who you are in relation to an awesome God. And Paul, in Romans 7, 9, he said he was alive apart from the law. Before the law showed him his sin, he thought he was doing pretty good. Okay. But then when the commandment came, sin came alive in him. He understood his sin. Um, he realized he was dead. He realized he was dead in his trespass. He realized he was dead in his sin. And he under, all he deserved was wrath in God. So, so the idea of the law and what you read in the word of God is not to flatter you and make you feel better and pump yourself up. It's to see your true self and to use the word of God to, um, to fix that. Okay, You don't just go away and forget about it. You keep remembering that and you work on it day and night as well. So uh, I think I said there, superficial looking may arouse this temporary conviction uh, of our own sinfulness, but it's soon forgotten. And uh, King James uh, kind of says it a little bit better. He says, in the one who is a hearer only, he says, straight away he forgetteth what manner of man he was. So you go away and you forget what manner of man and you in your sin. So the right use is in verse 25. Uh, literally it says, it says to look intently, but literally that, that word to look is to kind of to lean over and peer within, like you really want to get a look at it. Okay, you have to do something to get a look at it, not just superficially glancing at it, we'll say. So you look intently into it, a close and attentive look into the perfect law. The perfect law. The Word of God is the perfect law. Right? And nothing says it better than Psalm 19. So let me just read that to you quick. We've got a few minutes, okay? The law of the Lord is perfect, reviving the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure making wise is simple. The precepts of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. The commandment of the Lord is pure, enlightening the eyes. The fear of the Lord is clean, enduring forever. The rules of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. And more to be desired are they than gold, even much fine gold. Sweeter also than honey and the drippings of the honeycomb. Moreover, by them your servant is warned. And in keeping them, there is great reward. The law of the Lord is perfect. The word of the Lord is perfect. And it's described here as not only the perfect law, but the law of liberty. Um, referring to, at this time, the, the kind of the, the freedom or the liberty from the Jewish law and the dietary restrictions, the ceremonies, things like that. But, but really the law of liberty from our sin and the guilt that that produces in us. And the wrath and the death that that, that sin uh, will do to us. It says, so the one who does it rightly, he perseveres, okay? He looks into the, the law of liberty, the perfect law, and he perseveres, which means, you know, to, to stay in, to continue, to abide in, to remain in, to be constant in. He doesn't go away and forget about it. He perseveres in it. He stays constant in it. And he is blessed in his doing. There's that word doing again, doing again. He doesn't forget. He does. So the one who remains constant, he obtains his blessing from God, is what James says here. So, so really the summary of that is that, that hearers have this superficial, maybe short-term conviction uh, after they hear the word. Uh, and this results in self-deception because they just forget what they said, and they, but they think they're fine. And the, they're the ones that built their house on the sand. Yeah. Uh, but those who hear, do, persevere... They remain convicted of the sin that the law shows them in their heart, and they look to the Savior, and they remain obedient to the Word. They persevere with the Word, and they obtain the blessing. They are the ones building their house on the rock, on the rock. All right, so James here, just briefly, he seems to emphasize doing, uh, obedience, work, words, grace, and faith. I mean, I don't think that was in chapter 1 here, was it? Uh, we're, we'll get to talk about that a little more in chapter 2 again as we get to it. But, you know, it, it, we have said this many times before. 
that it's these things that James is talking about, the obedience, the works, <clears throat> the deeds, uh, they don't save you, okay? James never says they save you, okay? Um, but the word clearly teaches that if you are truly regenerate, you are a true believer, that it will inevitably follow with good works and obedience as well. We talk about that all the time. Romans 1, 5, uh, speaking of Jesus, through whom you have received grace and apostleship to bring about the obedience of faith. It puts those two words together, faith and obedience. Faith inevitably will have obedience followed. They are they're two sides of the same coin, in other words. Um, in Ephesians 2.10, after, after Ephesians 2a, and he talks about by grace you say through faith, it's not of your own doing. Um, he says in verse 10, for we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus unto good works, not for good works, but unto good works that God has prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. King James says that God is ordained beforehand. So in other words, you are saved through grace, by grace, through faith, it's not of your own doing, but God has already prepared these works that you will, that you will walk in them. And so in verse, um, or and then another little quote there from uh, John MacArthur, it says, the care, and this is the kind of way to look at it, the character of a man, and we've all seen this, this is kind of a general realization of that, the character of a man is evidenced primarily by his conduct, what he does, how, what he speaks, what he says. Uh, and over time, that conduct is, is reliable test of the inner person because inevitably uh, the true nature of that person will come out. I think we've seen that a lot even in pastors that have fallen. You know, maybe it's fallen into sin, but maybe they were never truly regenerate. Pastors that have uh, said, went away, stepped away from the faith, you know, their true nature will eventually come out. And unbelievers can keep up, and you say that, you can see many unbelievers that will put up an outward good conduct kind of thing uh, and see it, but not indefinitely. Something will eventually give. Their true nature will eventually show through. Just like true believers we have talked about, um, they may fall into sin uh, for a season or two, but, but if they're true believers, they can't remain in that sin indefinitely. They will come out. Um, briefly, 26 and 27. Um, vain religion and pure religion. If anyone thinks he's religious, doesn't bridle his tongue, receive his heart, that person's religion is worthless. Uh, religion that is pure and undefiled before God is this, to visit orphans and widows in their affliction and to keep oneself unstained from the world. So religion here is referring to external shows, outward ceremonies. If, if anyone thinks he's, he's pleasing God because of the things he's doing, the outward show, the religious ceremonies, the religious activity, uh, whatever he's doing, but he's unable to bridle his tongue. I think we know what that means, you know, kind of, it's not talking about necessarily cuss words, but it's talking about things that are not pleasing to God, that things will show up. Uh, and if he's unable to do that, he's deceiving himself. Uh, his heart's not right with God, uh, and his true nature will be revealed in many ways by the way he treats others, the way he speaks to others, by the condescending speech, uh, outbursts of angers, um, things like that. So the tongue and what people say is really a good indicator of their spiritual nature. Uh, and therefore, be slow to speak. Okay, Think about things before you speak and slow to anger. So you need to test yourself on here. Um, G, uh, Matthew 12, uh, speaking of the Pharisees, you brood of vipers, how can you speak good when you are evil? Okay, because out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. So what you say is evidence of what you are on the inside. And verse 37, by your words, you're going to be justified or by your words, you're going to be condemned. So be slow to speak. And pure religion, though, isn't anything for outward show, not trying to put up a facade. It looks to others, like he says here. It's not mixed with any traditions of man. It's not mixed with the corruption of the world. It's not for an outward show. Um, it's not a ceremony. It's pure and undefiled before God. Okay, Coram Deo, that means in the face of God. Coram Deo is, is, is what, she, what we should all 
uh, be doing. I mean, everything is before the face of God. We see it, but it's the way we should address everything we do is we're doing it before the face of God. We're doing it in front of God. We do it under his eye, under his authority, um, and it's for his glory. So that's how we, that's what we should live. And when it says visit orphans, it doesn't mean just, you know, go by and say hi, something like that. It, it really means uh, to visit with a purpose of comfort and, and charity or relief. Um, and orphans and widows, those were the most destitute at, at this point in time because they had really no means of support uh, at all. Um, but it really means anyone who's uh, uh, are really the proper objects of our charity uh, deciding that. But it's charity that you do, something you do, a work, a deed you do before God and not before man, unlike the Pharisees. Unlike the one who said, God, you know, the Pharisee, you're happy. You're, you're lucky to have me because I fast twice a week. I give tithes of all I do. Does it all for show. And then we must remain unstained from the world. That's the only way we can do that. First John 2.15, we've, we talk about that all the time. You don't love the world, the things in the world. Um, if you love the world, the love of the Father is not in you. Okay? If you're in love with the world, you're in enmity with God. Okay? For all that's in the world... Desires of the flesh, desires of eyes, prize of light. It's not from the Father, but it's from the world. So we've run out of time. Um, let's pray, and then we'll have a little time of fellowship, okay? Father, again, we thank you so much for your word that so clearly gives us instructions on what we should do with the word that you have given us. Lord, let us receive that word humbly. Let us use it to your glory. We ask these things in your son's name. Amen.